Good morning and welcome to the fourth meeting of the Pow and Chaffrey Drainage Commission Scotland Bill Committee. The first item on our agenda is to decide whether to take all future considerations of our draft preliminary stage report in private. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you. We move to agenda item two, which is evidence from the promoters. And today we are again taking evidence from the promoters of the bill, the Pow and Chaffrey Commissioners and their representatives. And I would therefore like to welcome Joe Guest, Commissioner, Hugh Grierson, Commissioner, Alistair McKee, partner Anderson Strathairn, and Shirley Davidson, solicitor McCash and Hunter. Um, this is the second um, evidence session we are taking with uh, the promoters, and since then we are committed to be very grateful to have the opportunity to have a site visit to the POW. Um, it is the view of the uh, committee um, that we accept that uh, a bill is required, and we believe that this would improve upon the 1846 Act. But, however, uh, the, the committee is of the view that the bill, as introduced, requires amendment in a number of areas, to essentially to deliver and improve transparency, accessibility and safeguards for the benefit of all concerned. Now, amendments are for um, a consideration stage, um, should the bill reach that stage, can only be brought forward by members of the committee. Um, however, it is a view of the committee that this process would be most constructive and uh, effective if it was the result of a cooperative and collaborative uh, process amongst all involved. Um, and if the process in general um, is one where all parties can work together, we have a view we'll be able to get a, a more um, favourable outcome and achieve all our shared goals. Um, I would like to begin by making reference to the visit uh, we had to the, uh, the POW. Um, and I, I was struck on the visit um, that we covered quite a, a significant bit of uh, territory across the, the length of the POW. And it struck me, and I'm sure it struck my colleagues in the committee, how sparsely populated much of the POW was until, of course, we reached the Balgown estate. Um, and what I'm struck by is that the Balgown Estate, as, it, as the bill currently stands, proposes one commissioner. Is that correct? Just for the record? That is correct. Now, as I understand it, the 73% of heritors live within the Balgown Estate. That means that 73% of heritors are represented by one commissioner, whereas the remaining 27% of heritors are represented by six commissioners. I would like to invite the commissioners or the representatives to comment upon that, if they believe that is equitable and fair. If I could take that question, uh, sir. Um, the, the, the matter has been considered in detail by the commissioners, and the commissioners will offer an amendment to allow up to two commissioners to represent the Balgowan section of benefited land. Due to this increase, which will be from seven to eight commissioners, it's important in the commissioner's view to consequently increase the quorum for meetings of the commission from three, which is set out in Schedule 3, Para 4, uh, to four commissioners. This would ensure that 50% of the commissioners will form a quorum, four out of the, of the eight. So we're, we're content with that. Okay. Any colleagues have any comments on that? No? Now, one of the other aspects that came up was the role of dismissing um, a commissioner and the role that heritors would play within that. Um, having had the opportunity to reflect um, over the summer, I just wonder if the commissioners or the representatives would wish to indicate what their current views are on whether the bill should include a mechanism to allow <coughs> the heritors to be involved in dismissing a commissioner. I'll take that question also, sir. Uh, under the bill, there is no right for the heritors to directly dismiss uh, commissioners. Uh, under section 13.2c, the commission may terminate a commissioner's appointment if that commissioner is unable to perform the functions of a commissioner or is unsuitable to continue as a commissioner. But that's the, that's the commissioner's right. Uh, it's felt that in practice, if heritors were extremely dissatisfied with a, commission, with a commissioner, and the other commissioners did not take prompt action, the heritors could convene a meeting 
under Section 71B of the Bill and make a motion at that meeting to request that the Commissioners use their powers to dismiss another Commissioner under 13, uh, Section 13.2c. We do accept that such a motion would not be binding on the Commission, but such a motion would be very difficult to ignore. I think that's, that's the position under the, under the Bill as it stands, but again, we, we have considered this point in more detail. And if, if members don't consider that this goes far enough, the Commission would offer an amendment to the Bill to give a simple majority of heritors in a particular section of benefited land, be it Lower, Middle, Upper or Balgowan, the right to dismiss a Commissioner, but only in relation to their particular section. So, for example, the heritors for the Balgowan section, which includes the Balgowan properties, could under this proposed amendment dismiss Commissioners for the Balgowan section, but not the Commissioners for the Lower, Middle or Upper sections. The, the, I suppose the, the, the reason that a majority of heritors overall of all the sections should not be able to dismiss the commissioners for any section is because each commissioner represents an identified section of benefit of land. They are appointed by that section, therefore it should be that section if the commissioner does not fulfil his, his obligations properly that should be able to dismiss them. So that, that is an a, amendment which the commissioners would be prepared to offer. Thank you very much. Any comments? There was just another area um, that I wish to clear up, and it was a discrepancy between um, Section 8 and Paragraph 13.2 of S Schedule 2. Um, and this was regarding a commissioner being able to continue in post if they were no longer to become a heritor. Um, are you willing to um, consider um, an amendment so that should a commissioner cease to be a heritor, they can no longer continue to be a commissioner? You've read my mind slightly, sir. Yes, we, we, we're happy. I think at the moment it's May, and it, and and the the commissioner's oh. position is one that they're quite content for uh, our commissioner to be dismissed if he ceases to become a heritor. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, the one final point I wanted to make at this stage, um, and it's an issue raised um, in, in one of the objections as well, and it's for the situation where a residential property um, is of a size of a plot, uh, how, to, how would I put this, it's a situation whereby you could have a small residential property and quite a significant plot of land which perhaps would incur a, a greater liability because of the acreage qualification than a larger property in a smaller plot of land. Um, I wonder if any consideration has been given to an amendment which would uh, allow the bill to take a better account of the position of heritors with small houses built on relatively large plots of land. Thank you, sir. That, that question is going to be answered by, by Joe Guest. But I think in, in order to assist his, his answer, it would be helpful, I think, to circulate some papers which will give a sort of representation of the relative size of um, the buildings to land area, to garden area, and to, I think, possibly to look at some of the schedules We've removed the, the, the names from these. These are sort of anonymised, but it will be really helpful when it comes to explain um, what, what the Commissioner's position is on that. And my colleague, um, Finn, has some papers for circulation. Do you want to...? There's five copies of that. And here's... Um, this is well, Stephen. Um, the, plan, the plans you've, first I should explain the, what you've just been handed first. The, the plans you've got um, show the whole length of the pow and the side ditches and the coloured the colored, um, plots are the individual um, assessments uh, of, of, of the benefited land for the full length of the pow and the side ditches. And if you turn to maps 
8, 9, and 10, they show all the residential properties except for one. There's one outlying one, which is at pa the power of in which is out in Chaffery Abbey. But um, all the rest are on those plans. In fact, on 9 and 10, if you look on those, it shows all, all the residential properties. And um, the schedule which we've circulated is, is the schedule of all the residential and commercial properties. What, what's been circulated before has been a, a heavily redacted version of this, which just showed um, which, which, where most of these columns were missing. This is the full schedule. The only thing that's missing is the name of the heritor. Um, th these plans and schedules were prepared right at the, at the very beginning, but um, the advice I had was that the plans and schedules that should be presented to you should be in a simplified, redacted version. But actually, it's very difficult to explain the thing without you seeing the whole thing. Um, so, um, in the right-hand column you see, of, of the schedule, you see the amount of the, of, the, of the new assessment, net of VAT. This is based on a budget of £20,000. There's another schedule of all the agricultural properties. This is just the residential and commercial properties. So you can see there, on a £20,000 budget, what the assessments would be for each property. And you'll see that most of them are really fairly small sums of money. There are only, I think, six, seven, which are more than £200. And if you look down the schedule there, you'll see number 57. It says additional on the Ross, and that's £339. Now, that is actually a, a commercial property. But it's the lime store. At, at Balgan, where there are large sheds and an open yard, and there's a very small residential property, but it basically it's a large commercial property. Um, the other, so the other five um, are, which are you can see there. Well, number seventy-five in Chaffery Abbey is a large house in the country, which is not on this plan. It's on plan number. Uh, Plan number four, plan four, you'll see a purple, a purple plot there, number 75. It's a large detached country house situated next to the ruined abbey. Um, and the other ones are uh, number 87. Number 87, and number 89, 90, 92, and 106. And you'll see that they're all, well, 91, if you look on sheet 9, you'll see 91 is that large red property. And then you go to sheet 10, you see the other properties are nearly all the well, they're basically the larger properties on the western side of the um, developed area. So, to put it into context, there really aren't very many of these properties, and they're all substantial houses and, um, and valuable properties. Um, I think to separate out um, the, you know, the, to, to have some formula for <coughs> uh, adjusting the valuation of these properties because they sit on large areas of large plots would be complicated and when you look at the very small numbers of them in the context of the whole thing I'd have thought it was an unnecessary complication but you know, if you feel strongly about it we could, we could come up with a, a formula but I think I don't think it's a very big problem when you look at the scale of this and you look at the schedule of properties we're only talking about a handful of properties, and they're all large properties on large sites.
I thank you for the plans and I, I appreciate the willingness to consider um, a bespoke formula potentially for those admittedly small number of homes that are affected. Um, our concern all this will be for the every individual home affected. It will be a significant it might be small in the grand scheme of things for the commission and the charging scheme, but for that obviously individual homeowner it could be quite significant and we always have to take cognizance of people who can be asset rich but income poor. Um, if you were <clears throat> if you did fail it was a you know something that has to be addressed then what I would suggest is that what would spring to mind is that uh, you would say that uh, for instance that if the that say two or three times the plot si the, the, the footprint of the house would be regarded as residential land and any extra would be regarded as amenity land because the amenity land in effect has a nil value because uh, in the current um, the, the values which are in the schedule at the moment we've got amenity land in at 500 pounds um, an acre and we've assumed that's the base value so it's it works out as nothing um, it's neutral so that would mean that the, um, in, 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 in the valuation, it's the it's the it's the value, the current value of the land, um, less the value of the un, less the unimproved value, and we've assumed that the unimproved value is five hundred pounds an acre. So if you put five hundred pounds on amenity land, it means that amenity land has no assessment. Do you see what I mean? Is to actually realise that within the bill, is that something you'd be willing to bring, consider bringing forward an amendment on? Yes, it wouldn't be. It would not be over, overly complicated to uh, to say um, that the that the, resi that the the assessed value of a residential plot would be a multiplier of the footprint of the building on it, and any surplus would be treated as amenity land. Would not be overly difficult to. Device. Can I just ask the, the formula that, that you use to calculate the charges? Is that the formula that has always been used? And and have you um, with, with the the housing developments? Did you have um, an open conversation with the owners to explain to them how that formula was calculated and how you came well, to the, the, the cost? present the present assessments? Yes. How the present assessments worked was that. Um, um, the history of it was that the first, I suppose, the first new house that was assessed was the one at a cha in Chaffrey, number 75. Mm. And when that was being built, I spoke with the, the, the person who was building it, and um, we agreed that uh, uh, it, it should be linked to what the water charges would be on council tax. Um, we're not providing water, we're providing drainage. And um, so, in discussion with them, uh, we came up with this figure of £150 for the property. And that's what that one actually still pays. And then, when the Manor Kingdom development came along, um, and I was discussing with the Manor Kingdom developers what the assessment should be, I just referred to this one. And we just applied that. So th there's never been any kind of independent assessment done no. of how the charges should be levied. No, it was based on, you know, it was based on the, the, uh, the example of the, the house at Chaffrey Abbey. And and did all of the commissioners agree to the way that was done? Was it discussed with all of the the commissioners, or did did, did I'm sure we were all aware of it and, and happy with it. Yes. Yeah. Well, if you're you're sure you you were all aware of it, isn't the same as it was discussed with you, and I, I, I yeah, need to understand I, whether it was one individual that made the decision on how those charges would be levied, or collectively if it was the group of commissioners. I suppose I conducted the negotiation as a surveyor for the commissioners, and then I would report back to the commissioner, right, okay. and they would say, "Yeah, we agree with that." Yeah, okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. 
I would just like to ask, for the benefit of the record, can you outline the promoter's current position on whether there should be an appeal mechanism relating to both disputes about individual bills and disputes about proposed amendments to the land categories? It would be helpful you know, for the committee if you could explain the reasoning behind your current position. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question. Um, the, 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 I suppose the, the heritor's the, theoretical grounds for objection, sort of appeal mechanism, would be that either the, the budget which is being set, the annual budget, includes matters which the commissioners have no power to include, or the estimates are too high, and that's why they they're wish to oppose that. <clears throat> that. That being so, we consider that a right to object to that in practice is, is unnecessary because of the new measures which the um, proposed Act brings in. And it's different from the old Act because under, under the old Act, what the right of appeal or objection would be would be the increase in value of the property as a result of improvements to the, the POW under the old 1846 Act. That's not really what we're doing under the new kind of way in which this bill works and the way in which the, the annual assessments are set and the calculation is therefore made, which is a very sort of mechanical process. So there's little sort of moving part. The moving parts are in the bill itself. There's not judgment being exercised. Um, so the, 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 the bill itself sets out what the commissioners can include in the budget. So including anything which they can't do would be ultra virus and would be challengeable by way of judicial review. So the budget is set by the commissioners, including, as we now know, if we include it, two representatives from Bal Balgowan. So we'll have two commissioners for there. So in practice, the, the view of the commission is that they're really unlikely to uh, overestimate the budget as they're going to be the most affected by it. And that the, the, the budget itself is an estimate of the expenditure for the coming assessment year. And we've specifically provided, anticipated for surpluses or shortfalls to be taken in, into account. So if a budget one year is an overestimate, the surplus will be uh, reduced the next year's budget. Well, the, 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 we're, we're very clear that this is a matter which has vexed the, the, the committee and the, the commissioners have um, considered this very carefully to, to see whether they could um, include some form of additional measure or protection within the bill. Um, it, it's not felt that such an amendment could be a formal right of objection as such because we need to ensure that whatever sort of third party mechanism is going to be given to the the, the heritors in regard to the annual assessments would have to be fairly straightforward and cost proportionate, bearing in mind that any expenses incurred by the commissioners would actually be have the effect of increasing the annual assessment. So for, for that reason, um, the, the commissioners, whilst reluctant to provide an objection procedure as such, uh, which would involve reference to a third party such as the courts, they would be prepared to um, offer an amendment uh, for your consideration for a procedure which, which is really along the following lines. I think the, the, what we have in mind is that the commissioners would notify the draft budget to all heritors, which would include an individual assessment, so it would actually let them know exactly how much it is anticipated they would have to pay for the annual charge. The heritors would then have 21 days within which to comment on that to the, the commissioners. And the commissioners would, uh, in terms of any amendment, be bound to have regard to those comments when finalising the, the budget, but they would not be bound to follow them. So really it's giving them a kind of right of, a right of having their say before the commissioners, before that budget is finally sent. So it does go a bit further, but it's not a sort of formal right of appeal because we, we, we just think that would be disproportionate in the circumstances and it would, it would, it would hike up costs. Uh, which Sure. <coughs> the amendment that you're suggesting would enable heritors to raise an objection, but for the commissioners to disregard it. Well, they, they, they would have to take it into account. Can you define what that means, please? Well, I think they'd, they'd, ha they'd have to have regard to it, but they would not be bound by it. It would be, I suppose, analogous people are entitled to... So how would a commissioner demonstrate that they had had regard to an objection? Well, I think, I think they'd, have to, they'd have to meet and they'd have to consider them carefully and they'd have to offer reasons why they were choosing to disregard the, the will of the heritors who were making the particular comments. So they'd have to have a good reason for it. I think the point is that in a 
in a budget of £20,000, if you've got one vexatious uh, heritor who raises an objection, and you know because that's what they want to do, mm -hmm. I mean, an objection process could cost thousands of pounds. That's going to get paid for by all the other heritors. I appreciate that's, that. the, that's uh, the point, really, isn't it? Our consideration that's is... That's one of my points, but the, the, you know, the, the, the reason the committee has raises this is the, the existing Act has been in place now for over a century and a half, and we have to have consideration to potentially, not just any potential vexatious heritor, but the commissioners in the future. Um, I think there's a concern that ultimately this amendment has been proposed. It doesn't seem to be addressing the concerns that have been raised by the committee. Have consideration been given to any other potential amendments or perhaps you can discuss and unpack a bit more how you came to this decision to offer this amendment? Well, obviously the, the, there's, there's a spectrum as to, as to how, how the bill could be amended. You could either give them a, a formal right of appeal to the courts or to some formal you know, arbitration. And it was you know, just picking up on, on um, um, Joe's point, th th it was considered that was really disproportionate given the sums we're, we're, we're dealing with here. Uh, and obviously any cost of that process would then be wrapped up in the overall assessment, which would increase it for everyone. So say, say for example, on a, on a £20,000 budget, if one particular appeal process cost £5,000, we'd have to get lawyers involved and what have you, um, that, that would increase everyone's overall payment by 25% just for one person. So it's you have to be quite sort of careful about it. I mean, I, I do understand this, the, the ideological principle which, which you're bringing. I, I do fully understand it. Um, but we, we, we felt that um, that we could offer something which would, which, which would give them the right to put their comments in writing. They would have to be taken into account. Um, the commissioners would have to look at those comments. They would have to consider them carefully. And if they're making a good point, then they may well persuade the commissioners that they have set too high a budget. If the commissioners simply disregard them or dismiss them without taking them into account, then again, we have the mechanism of judicial review where they have failed to take into account important material information before making a decision. So it, it sort of exposes the commissioners, if they flippantly disregard it, to a potential claim for judicial review. So it kind of strengthens, I think, the sort of, and focuses the kind of judicial review point better. And do you think so that judicial review is a uh, a realistic course of action for a heritor living in, say, the Balkan state. It, it 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 can be an you know a, a, an expensive process. I, I grant you, and it's you know uh -huh. it's it's not it's not it's an, not an it's not readily available. Uh -huh. An expense that would dwarf the expenses incurred by the commission for its own review process. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Oh, sorry. No. Well, I hear what you say, and I do accept what you're saying. I understand where you're coming from. But I also understand where we're coming from, and I'm just wondering if there's some form of consideration could be given. You know, to my mind, you know, you're, if you wish to complain and put in your objection to the commissioners, I understand they've obviously got to have reasons and make them valid, etc. Is there no way that, if no resolution could be achieved, that it could be put out to a third party, say another surveyor or somebody else, without actually having to go down the court route? You know, very, very similar to, uh, I think what I'm really thinking about here is if you, have a, if you have a rental property and the landlord comes along, increases the rent too high and makes it, you know, further than inflation, far too high, then the tenant doesn't go back to the landlord to say, oh, I'm really sorry about this. They have the right to put it out to a third party who's maybe slightly more independent. Would an independent expert be a viable option? So that's really yeah, what I'm uh, getting at. Can I just, just confer I, on that? I mean, I, yes, I do understand you know, your point fully. Because that really was my next question I was coming to. So. Can I, can I yes. My initial reaction is that it's not a landlord-tenant relationship. I appreciate The commissioners that. have a, a, an equal interest in, and, and they also, I think, have some expertise in what they're talking about. I fully appreciate um, that too, as yes. do landlords sometimes and tenants. You know, so it was just an analogy. I was just giving you a comparison that, that sprung to my mind. Because Which isn't I'm, really a direct analogy, so well, because okay, their just, just disregard converge. that comparison then, and let's go back to where we were originally standing. And from what I'm listening to, what you're telling me is, I'm a heritor. If I wish to complain, I am basically going back into the same commissioners who've made the original decisions. Albeit, there is a requirement for them to give me reasons, 
But if their reasons are very similar to their first reasoning, then my complaint is basically dismissed. So that's why I was just trying to make it easier by giving you the comparison and saying, is there a way forward from here? There has has um, an elected representative sitting on the commission. But I still come back to where I stand. You're going back into the commissioners to say I'm not happy, etc. I, I don't think it's a... a Can we maybe just have a wee conference yes, about that? Yes, please do. Just, that. I, mean, I think it's yes, a valid question. You. Thank, thank, thank you for indulging us with, with the discussion there, and, and I think that we, we, we've reached agreement that um, we're certainly prepared to consider some form of referral to an independent expert, mm -hmm. which would probably be a severe, uh, which is mm -hmm. kind of similar to what we have in, in uh, clauses 11 and 12 of the mm -hmm. bill for the revaluation process. I think the, the, the issues for the Commissioner is not, is, the, is not just the cost. It is the speed with which that decision yes. can be reached, because if that decision isn't reached, it holds up the whole annual assessment and we can't move on. So we've got this kind of right of representation, which, which you know, has this 21-day turnaround period mm -hmm. for having make it. I think we need to have you know, an equally mm -hmm. fast turnaround for our referral yes. to an independent surveyor. Yes. Um, well, I really appreciate the argument that commissioners themselves have a clear interest, and I committed does not doubt the dedication and diligence with which the existing commissioners carry out their duty. However, as promoters of a bill, you're asking for a bill to become an act which confers significant powers, and that is why we are prosecuting this line of questioning as we are. Um, uh, but I do welcome the consideration of an amendment. Um, I appreciate this is perhaps just an idea you've um, decided you're presenting to the committee just now. I would appreciate if you write to the committee. Um, setting out in more detail what these proposals would actually entail. Um, I think perhaps get that ahead of the uh, next 25th of October, if I'm aware of the consideration. If it would be possible within the next two weeks, to see. Of course. Um, of course, yes. The, 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 other, the other point which I think ha had been asked, and it's been quite a lengthy, um, lengthy answer on that, was, was about the I suppose Clause 11 and Clause 12, the, the revaluation uh, of the 10-year the, the revaluation and the movement between land categories and what are the mechanisms for that, because that's another area in which heritors may have clearly uh, a, an issue. And under, under, the, under the bill at the moment, um, whilst it you know, might appear slightly less beneficial than under the 1846 Act, the, the process is really controlled to the use of an independent surveyor, which is very similar to wh where we were with, in answering part A of this two-part question. Because um, in terms of Clause 11 and 12, the surveyor, uh, like the, the 1846 valuator, acts independently from the Commission, and the surveyor must be a member of the RICS professional body rather than simply a skillful and impartial person under the 1846 Act. And in practice, similar to the 1846 Act, the heritors can make representations directly to the surveyor in that regard. Um, in, in practice, we think the valuation issues are not particularly complicated because they re relate to the category of land which is being looked at. Um, is it going to be amenity, agricultural, or commercial, uh, or residential, or agricultural? Um, and the if, if, I suppose, if, if, if there were a right to appeal to the courts beyond that surveyor, what the court would do when faced with a valuation question 
is to refer the matter to a surveyor. So we'd really be doing the, you know, just sort of going from in the shortest route to that. Um, and certainly the, the promoter believes that the, the, the use of the independent surveyor is a, is a cost-effective system for all involved, having regard to the relatively low level of assessments. But I do appreciate your point about people having the rights. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Just Thank you. Your question. Is that all right, Jess, I proceed. Property factors are currently regulated under the Property Factors <coughs> Scotland Act 2011. The Law Society suggested in their written submission to us that consideration should be given to whether the Commission should be regulated under the 2011 Act. What would be your view on that proposal? Um, I can sure. answer that. Um, the Commissioners don't consider that they fall within the definition of a property factor. Um, Section 2A of the 2011 Act defines a property factor as someone who, in the course of that person's business, manages the common parts of land owned by two or more persons. But the POW doesn't fall within a def the definition of a common part. OK, thank you. Thank you, and good morning. Um, can I explore in a bit more detail the issue of um, future statutory charges um, and also the, the, beaver, the beaver barrier that we discussed um, the last time you were here? Um, now, the commissioners have a licence from SEPA for dredging the, the POW and its, and its tributaries. Um, there, there are also um, additional statutory charges under regulation from construction, design, health and safety and, and wildlife legislation. Now, you've, you've already given us some indication of those charges. Are you able to give us any more detail around what the, the future statutory charges might look like? Could, could I just come in there? Because I think we've got a further quote on the cost of the, the, the beaver barrier, which I think my colleague, um, Mr Blair, will circulate which is relevant to the to this discussion because we, we've actually had the matter formally costed per per barrier, okay. which is is relevant to this question. Mm -hmm. Statutory charges paid are um, the super licence, which was a one-off payment of £700, mm -hmm. and a payment of £35, which, which is in connection with the Data Protection Act. Uh, it's very difficult to predict what other um, charges might might appear. Um, the, the, the main one, as you've, as you've mentioned, is, uh, which has, which has a, a, appeared on us, is the, is the issue of beavers. Um, beavers were uh, released illegally in the, Bailiff, in the Ailith area um, about ten years ago, and from there they've spread throughout Tayside, and they've caused significant problems in um, arterial watercourses such as the power of Inchaffery. Um I met with, um, uh, I, I first of all went to see Rosanna Cunningham at the end of last year, and she put me in touch with uh, the SNH's beaver consultant, who is uh, Royston Campbell Palmer. And I met her and went round the whole power with her. and. Um, her proposal is that the, uh, the POW should become a trial beaver exclusion area because she recognises that beavers are incompatible with what we're trying to do there. And um, she spoke about having a barrier at the lower end of the POW and a barrier at the upper end of the POW 
and that in between these two barriers the beavers would be managed. And um, uh, then had a subsequent meeting with the people from SNH. There's a, a dedicated officer who deals with beavers and there's also a land manager who deals with the, uh, the, the negotiations, um, the, the, land, the land rights which they need for this. And <coughs> uh, they asked that I get a quotation for forming these beaver barriers. So I've discussed this with Ian Walston, who's the contractor who does most of the drainage work and groundworks in, in the area. And who and he and his father have done the work on the Parrow for the la over the last 30 years, and he's very experienced and very capable. And anyway, he's produced this quotation, which you've got before you, which is basically 21,000 pounds per barrier, and it's it's a basically it's a heavy-duty gate which would go across the Parrow, and then side fences which would go out. Um, a distance of 150 metres on either side to stop the beavers coming up, walking around the barrier. Um, so that's potentially a cost of over £40,000. Um, uh, the the, the um, SNH um, uh, land agent was suggesting that there should be also, there need to be uh, legal agreements with all the people on whose land these barriers would sit which of course would cost more. I think there are potentially five people involved, so if you have five agents and five solicitors, you, know, you can see the cost racking up further. But he, I think he thinks now, from my last conversation with him, that some more informal letter of agreement would suffice, which would be a lot cheaper. Um, initial indications from SNH is that uh, government funding for this would be £10,000. Which would leave a shortfall of over thirty thousand pounds. I'm hoping that they will um, increase their uh, grant funding because, at the end of the day, you know the beaver problem is uh, one that's come on the power. Um, I mean, it's they've been released illegally um, and they've now been given protected status. Um, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. We just have to deal with the problem. Um, and what, um, I take it you're in communication with the Scottish National Heritage at the moment yes, to try and, to try I, and um, I've sent them a negotiate? Copy of, I've sent them a copy of this, of this quote and um, that's the next step really is to go and see if we can persuade them to give more grant funding. Well, they, they just report back to the Scottish Government and the Scottish Government. Mm. Are you aware if there's a formula for providing grant funding? If, if Sorry? Is, is there a formula for providing the grant funding? If, I if don't I'm, know I'm where the figure of 10,000 came from. I don't know how it was calculated. I think that was, I think that was a, probably a figure you know, just back from the sky before they'd seen these costs. I don't think they thought it was going to cost anything like so this. So when do you anticipate you'll have more information on the, the, the funding for the beaver barriers? I don't know. I, mean, I, need, to go back, I need to go back to SNH and... Um, mm -hmm. Ask them, and uh, no doubt they'll have to report back to the Scottish government. And Be know. because obviously it has a significant impact on oh, huge, on, yeah. on our, our, our discussions oh, apart huge. from anything uh, yeah. else. Because if um, ten thousand pounds is all that Scottish National Heritage are prepared to give you, and you go ahead and put up the beaver barriers, you'll need to raise thirty thousand pounds, uh -huh. which will have a, a massive cost on on the heritors. Um, have you considered how you will how you will do that? I, I, I suspect it'll have to be phased over a couple of years to make it palatable. I mean, we won't enjoy paying for it either. Um, I think it's inevitable it will affect our ability to start cleaning the power again. Um, the maintenance we'd like to get to on the power will be put on delay until we can pay for this over a few years, I think is the most likely way forward. Mm. And what impact would that have on the POW? Um, because obviously we've seen firsthand what the, what the POW does. And, and to delay any maintenance... Um, the, the, the bottom of this POW is beginning to silt up and the, the sides that aren't stable are beginning to slip in. Um, and the more that happens, the less water can escape from the valley uh, and the higher the chance of flooding in the valley. Mm. I, suspect, I suspect the reality is it's going to take some time to sort out 
the uh, dis have the discussions with SNH, who in turn discuss it with the Scottish Government. And you know, if next year we can get back to cleaning the power, that probably be the priority is to catch up on so the maintenance, like and then deal with this issue. Mm. Um, and it probably, you know, if, if it is thirty thousand pounds has to be raised, then that'll have, have probably have to be spread over a couple of years. Yeah, because the potential cost implication for the heritors is, oh, is, no. is pretty substantial. We we know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, no. but, but obviously, uh, committee would appreciate any any further information yeah. you can give us on I, I, discussions. I, I, with th thank you. I, I think the intention will be after this meeting to be writing formally to SNH to ask for progress to see what they're they're doing in terms of grant funding because yeah. this clearly is a big issue for the for the commission. Okay. Um, can I ask you now about um, debt recovery? Because on the twenty fourth of May, when you when you came to committee, you gave us some um, information in relation to historical. Debt and your approach to collecting or not collecting um, historical debt. And for the benefit of the record, could you confirm your understanding of the relevant uh, provisions in the bill and the likely approach to debt recovery in, in practice? And how will you determine what that will be? Well, I can report that the commissioners met at a formal meeting on the 15th of August when this matter was considered. The commissioners recognised that those householders who had been making payments may feel aggrieved, but it was agreed and minuted that the historic unpaids will be written off. This was felt to be a pragmatic approach in all the circumstances, including the fact that the individual amounts in question are relatively small, and it's possible it wouldn't be economical to incur the potential costs incurred, uh, which would be involved in pursuing these, these sums. Okay, and I understand that you've taken that approach in, in this instance, but how will you be sure in the future if there are a different set of commissioners that they may take a different approach? Because you need to have consistency in, in however you, you manage the monies that are collected. Uh, historic unpaid or but, um, new assessments but, but you, under you, the... Uh, you, you, need, you need to future-proof this as well. You, you need to have an understanding from the commissioners how they will pursue... Um, in any future debt, because I understand the decisions that you've made in relation to historic debt. Yes, I understand yes. why you've done that, and, yes. and you know you've agreed that that's the way you're going to handle this. But in the future, if people don't don't pay, in the future, if people don't pay, I believe the commissioners would uh, take court action for recovery. You you believe, or you believe it to be a fact? I believe it to be a fact. Okay. 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 Thank you. Sorry, I've lost number 11, sorry. Can I get your number 11? I've lost sorry. sorry, I put my pages out of order here. Sorry, <laughs> excuse me. Right, one of the policy issues covered in our previous evidence session was the need for good information for prospective purchasers about financial obligations associated with the POW. You have stated support for a requirement for the land plans and amendments to them to be made publicly available and we look forward to the bill being amended in that regard should it pass through the consideration stage. Likewise, would you support an amendment to the bill so that the Re Register of Heritors is publicly searchable? If this could be done in a way which is compatible with data protection legislation. I can give you some thinking there. Um, where are we? Sorry about this. Yeah. Um, we looked at the data protection issues. Um, the, the, the commissioners are willing to make the register of heritors publicly available. Um, you'll recall that actually on the Parliament's own website. The Parliament redacted certain details which the Commissioners had provided, presumably because it itself had concerns about data protection issues. The Commission is already registered as a data controller with the Information Commissioner. The Data Protection Act 1998 requires that personal data is to be processed fairly and lawfully, 
and is not to be processed until, unless at least one of the conditions in Section 2 of the Act is met. Now, one of these conditions is that the processing is necessary for compliance with any legal obligation to which the data controller <coughs> is subject. So if the new Act requires the publication of the Register of Heritors, then we assume that this condition, namely that it's necessary for compliance with a legal obligation, would be met. That's the answer. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, can you just explain to committee how you will ensure that prospective purchasers are aware of their obligations un under the POW? Um, there are, in the Commissioner's view, satisfactory methods by which future purchasers will have the matter flagged up to them. Um, in rural and semi-rural areas, it's recognised it's not unusual for their not being connected to the public sewage system. And in the case of the benefited properties here, the question, is the property connected to the public drainage system or does it lie ex adverso the public drainage system? That question is covered in the Home Report, the Survey Report, standard missives and in property inquiry certificates. And the answer to that question will or certainly should always produce the answer no. And that alone, I would submit, puts the solicitor acting for the purchaser on notice that that solicitor should make the appropriate inquiries and advise the client accordingly. Um, all the houses in the Balgowan housing development, um, their land certificates make reference and set out in full the deed of conditions and that makes reference to the requirement to pay a share of the annual drainage levy to the Power of Inchaffrey Drainage Commission. In relation to the property inquiry certificates which are produced in the general course of a sale and purchase transaction, um, I've spoken personally to the local private searcher, which most solicitors in Perthshire area use, and also to Miller and Bryce, which is, I think, the largest searcher covering Scotland. And um, they have confirmed, in principle, they've got to be more than happy to make specific reference to the POW Act if we provide the land plans, the addresses, the postcodes, or whatever, of the properties and the land in question. So again, that would, that would assist. So I would say it's absolutely the normal practice for solicitors to ascertain what the drainage position is. And if they fail to do so, or they fail to adequately advise their client of the position, then there exists a complaints procedure, free to clients of solicitors, the availability of which has to be brought to the client's attention in terms of law society rules. OK. Um, given that each section of the POW has commissioners that represent it, um, would it be unreasonable to um, ask the commissioners to speak to a a any owners that are, that are moving in to explain to them? Because, I, I mean, I fully understand what you're saying, but there is, um, there's a lot involved when you buy a house. Not everyone checks every single bit of fine print. A solicitor potentially could, could miss something. So would it be unreasonable to ask the, the commissioners for, for each area to have um, almost an obligation to, to, to explain to, to purchasers that under the POW that, that this is their obligation and they are required to pay? Isn't there something in the bill that um, a heritor remains responsible for the assessment? Until, uh, and, um, notice, yeah. and, until he gives formal notice to the incomer, so it's he's going to be, you know, he's going to be incentivised to tell the people. Otherwise, he carries he's carries on being legally liable to pay the bill. That's right. That's that's another that's another good point. No. Yes. I, I think we 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 certainly can provide information to those who come to seek it. The really hard part is is getting out to the people who who are coming in and don't know to come and speak to us. Um, we can certainly provide information to, to those who contact us. Um, it's the responsibility for, for getting in touch that's the hard bit, isn't it? No. But, but I mean, to be fair, we're, we're not talking about a town-sized housing development. The, the number of houses that are along the POW are, are fairly small, and commissioners represent different areas on the POW. For example, the Balgown Estate, if another 10 houses were built, the commissioners that live in that area would know 10 houses were getting built and 10 people were going to move in. 
or am I wrong? Well, if they were new houses, I don't think that's much of a problem because we're going to get notified if, if there's new development. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about keeping tabs on purchases and sales of flats, I don't know how the Commission... But, but again, I go that. back to my point that we're not talking of massive numbers of houses. They are f it's a fairly small number of houses we're talking about. Even with the existing housing stock that's there, if it's moving on to new owners, there's it's, there's it's fairly small. There is a Balgaran Community um, Residents Association, isn't there? Yes. yes. So that might be a, a means by which they would be informed. And, and um, um, what is it? Oh, we met. It's, it's the chairman of it, isn't it? Yes, Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Could, could I suggest perhaps it is something you maybe go away and think about um, and, and come back to us with some um, suggestions on how you can make the, the, the communication a, a bit clearer? Quite clear um, at the moment. I, I'm not sure whether somebody has to. Uh, keep an eye on for sale notices going up or removal vans moving in. I think, I think given the, um, as, I, as I said already, the, the, the kind of fairly small number of houses, if there are community council organisations or there are community groups, um, I, I don't think it's, it's too onerous a responsibility to um, ask people to perhaps share information and knowledge. It's quite, that would be it's quite likely that the Balgarn Commissioners will be on that residence association mm -hmm. yes. and yeah. know, yes. would know what's going on. Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Just picking up on the questions of my colleagues, I just wonder if uh, Commissioners would want to comment more generally um, on what actions we'll undertake to communicate with. Um, editors to keep them informed of the work the Commission is doing. Um, there was obviously some discussion in the previous evidence session, um, references made to potential website, etc. And I would be grateful if uh, the Commissioners or representatives would like to update the Committee and what action they will be taking to make sure that editors are fully informed of all the work that the Commission is undertaking. To do it. Mm -hmm. And that would have the information about the land plans and the list of heritage and the assessments and uh, kind of minutes of meetings it could all be on there. It would be a, a much more efficient way for us to communicate with them than sending out letters. Yes, I, th I think the, 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 the website is a, is a firm intention of the of, of the commissioners. Now, I, I think I think if if the committee are to make an amendment to the bill, if it, if it, if it proceeds, which requires the full publication of the register of heritors, and that can be linked to that website. That will be an extremely good way of raising the public profile of what this is all about and what it achieves, its aims and ambitions, and, and what, what the charges are. So I think that's a real that'd be a real benefit. Finally, can we look forward to Power and Charity Drainage Commission Facebook page or Twitter account? <laughs> <laughs> Very possibly. <laughs> possibly. Okay. Do you have any other questions? Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'd have a few short additional comments to make. If that certainly, if that, if that be, would that be uh -huh. possible? It won't take long. Um, the the commissioners have some additional comments to make in regard to today's questions and, and points made generally in objection to the bill. The 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 function of the POW is to drain approximately an area of 1,930 acres of land. That drainage function directly benefits agriculture, commercial and residential land within the benefited area through flood alleviation, surface drainage and foul drainage. It's important to observe that the Commissioners act on a voluntary not-for-profit basis and their proposed function under the Bill is to repair, maintain, renew and improve the POW for the benefit of all affected proprietors across the four sections of the POW. Approaches have been made by the Commissioners to Perth and Kinross Council, Scottish Water and SEPA, none of whom are prepared to take over responsibility for the POW. The arrangements under the 1846 Act require to be updated to take account of changing circumstances, including the construction of residential properties on part of the benefited land at Bell Gowan. The Bill, which has been subject to significant public consultation, updates a number of arrangements, particularly in regard to the calculation of the annual assessment payable by all heritors. 
The bill has clearly raised a number of issues, particularly with regard to residential properties in terms of the actual benefit that they consider they receive from the POW, but also concerns in regard to the arrangements and level of annual assessments. Firstly, I'd like to say all residential properties do directly benefit in terms of enabling those properties to have surface water drainage and foul drainage, some have flood alleviation. The residential properties would not have been granted permission without the opportunity for surface and foul water drainage, which ultimately goes into the POW. In addition to the individual septic tanks that drain into the POW, the committee, I believe, saw at its site visit the wastewater treatment plant for the, uh, for the new development at Balgown, which drains into the POW. As indicated in evidence, the commissioners do not consider that the annual assessment should be subject to a cap or limit. Whilst no capital expenditure other than the provision of two beaver gates is foreseen, the imposition of a cap would really place in practice an unworkable and unacceptable limitation on the work of the commissions in their repair, maintenance, renewal and improvement of the, pap, of the POW. Such a cap would mean that the bill is not future-proofed in circumstances where it must be. In regard to the matter of anticipated costs, we've heard in evidence today that these beaver gates will cost uh, in the range of £42,000 to install, including the costs of any uh, arrangement, informal or formal, with, with the landowners. I think the, the, the provision of the, the beaver gates is a matter of concern for the committee and indeed the Commission, and is an item of extraordinary expenditure, which although necessary to protect the POW, has not been on the Commissioner's making and is really a consequence of policies and legislation that requires the reintroduction and now protection of beavers, and indeed now the, I think, the first in Scotland, an exclusion uh, area for beavers. It's considered important that SNH should consider making sufficient grants available to pay these works, and we will be writing shortly after uh, the meeting today to SNH to follow up upon their deliberations on grant funding and their meeting with the, the Scottish Government. And I wish to just concentrate on the amendments to the bill that the commissioners are prepared to, to offer for the committee's consideration to address your concerns. Um, these proposed amendments, I believe, would provide heritors, particularly the Balgowan heritors, with additional statutory protections. The first of these is to allow up to two commissioners to represent the Balgowan section of the benefited land, as the number will increase from seven to eight. Uh, this would mean that we would need to increase the quorum of meetings of the Commission from three to four, which would ensure 50% of the Commissioners would form a quorum. That would be four of the eight. The Commissioners are minded to offer an amendment to allow a simple majority of heritors of a particular section to dismiss a Commissioner, but only in relation to their particular section. The Commissioners will, will, are prepared to offer an amendment, which will be a formal uh, right for uh, objectors to the annual assessment to comment upon that, that 21-day period we talked about, and that will be backed up, I think, by our reference to an independent surveyor, as, as we discussed. Um, I think we're, we're offering an amendment to, uh, to make it clear that when heritors cease to be heritors, they cannot be commissioners, or commissioners cease to be heritors, they cannot be um, commissioners. Um, the further change, I think, um, amendment is an amendment to require um, this, this is our offering of, of amendment for your consideration to amend the bill to require that the full register of heritors will be publicly available, which I think will match nicely with the, the website when that comes forward, and that will enable the, the requirements of the Data Protection Act uh, 1998 to be met. The Commissioners have also carefully considered the position on historic debt and have agreed that the historic uh, unpaid assessments should be written off. And this was considered to be a pragmatic approach, as the individual assessments are relatively small, and it would be possible um, that it would not be cost-effective to recover these in any event. So, in conclusion, the purpose of the bill is to update the arrangements in the 1846 Act by having fair, straightforward and future-proofed procedures, which will allow the maintenance, repair, renewal and improvement of the POW for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. Have any further comments? remains for me to thank the panel and the witnesses for attending today and we will now suspend briefly until our witnesses to leave.
The next item on the agenda is for the committee to give preliminary consideration to the three admissible objections to the bill which were lodged. We will consider each of the three objections in turn and come to a view on whether the committee believes whether each objection clearly demonstrates that the interests of the objector are adversely affected by the bill. If we do not believe that to be the case, then the objection will be rejected. Any objections not rejected will be given, cons uh, will be con given consideration in full at consideration stage, should the bill reach that stage. All objectors will be informed of the outcome of the process after the meeting. Unless there are any questions from members as to the process, we will begin. First, to consider the objection of Gareth Bruce. Are we content to let this progress to consideration stage? Agreed. Next, we will consider the objection of Mr and Mrs Bijum. Are we content to let that progress to consideration stage? And finally, we will consider the objection of Tom Davis. Are we content to let that progress to consideration stage? As the next item is in private, the public business of the committee is now concluded. The next meeting of the committee will be on Wednesday 25th October at 11am and will be in private to consider a draft preliminary stage report. Now suspend the meeting to allow the gallery to be clear as we move into private session.